This is the first in a series of 22 presentations for first year radiology residents um, on the chest rotation. Um, I'd like to start with just an acknowledgement of some of the most important um, chest um, teachers um, who taught me um, and inspired my, um, my love of teaching. When it comes to understanding um, chest radiology, um, it quickly dawns on uh, many of us that uh, it's this complicated relationship of different diseases and different imaging features. And um, it's an important thing to learn as we um, embark on trying to interpret chest imaging. And there's kind of two philosophies um, that we can take to try to learn this. Um, one traditional way of approaching this is to study or learn about a disease, um, disease A, for example, here, and the different imaging features that are associated with it. Um, sometimes um, those relationships are relatively strong, and sometimes maybe the relationship may be a weaker one, like the one I've drawn with the dotted line here. And then uh, we'll learn about another disease on another day um, and learn that it has certain imaging features that's associated with it. And obviously some of these may overlap with, um, you know, um, another disease you learn. Um, there's an alternative um, approach to kind of um, learning these relationships. And that's what we refer to as a kind of a more feature-based approach. Uh, instead of uh, learning um, disease A and the imaging features it presents with and disease B and its imaging features, uh, we can approach things from the perspective of imaging features. Um, so we learn about a particular imaging feature and the diseases that are associated with it. And then we may learn about another imaging feature and learn about the diseases that may be associated with it. And then a different uh, imaging feature and uh, different diseases that's um, associated with that other imaging feature. And in many ways, um, I think as we first begin to learn chest radiology as um, kind of, um, say, first year residents, um, perhaps approaching it from the perspective of imaging feature um, as a way to organize um, our approach uh, might make um, a lot of sense. Um, after all, um, if you're on call in the reading room, uh, what you're usually going to be presented with, the input, if you will, are the imaging features. Uh, you'll see something on um, a patient's CT or X-ray, and it's up to you to kind of think about, well, with uh, imaging feature one, uh, what are the diseases that are associated with it, and imaging feature seven, which I'm also seeing, uh, what are its diseases, and kind of get a sense of what makes the most sense. And so, um, you know, there are different ways of approaching how to understand chest radiology, which are complementary. Um, but um, from a perspective of an early learner, um, uh, I personally favor a feature-based approach. And then as we move later into residency, uh, learning and teaching from a more disease-based approach and kind of learning about this relationship, this network of diseases and imaging features from both directions by the time you're finished. Um, when it comes to this feature-based approach to chest radiology that we're going to take um, during your first rotation on chest, um, you know, just a few basic principles, you know, that we accept. We accept that the underlying pathology of every disease we're going to learn about is relatively constant and that imaging features should be predictable um, regardless of what imaging modality you're looking at. Um, just, you know, we'll be a little bit more specific and sensitive um, the better our imaging modality is. And so um, all the things we're going to be learning about will apply regardless if you're reading a chest x-ray or a CT or even a chest MRI. Um, we also have to understand that when it comes to chest radiology, um, um, giving an accurate diagnosis requires more than just what's on the image, but uh, understanding of what the setting of this particular interpretation is occurring in. Um, what's the clinical history, clinical picture um, of the patient um, in this study? So um, we're going to break down um, things that we would like you to learn um, during your first rotation on chest um, into um, 18 um, presentations, um, which uh, will focus on basically concepts and strategy to making differential diagnosis, um, and four talks um, about just the mechanics of getting the work done. Um, 
the vocabulary we're going to use, um, some basic tips on how to read a CT or a frontal or a lateral chest x-ray. Um, but, you know, we're going to spend a lot of time focusing on concepts and differential diagnosis strategy. The first 10 talks are going to be um, on diseases of the lung. Uh, one talk on the large airways, so we're talking about the trachea and the bronchi. Uh, one talk on the pleura. Um, four talks on mediastinum and hyla, and then a final talk on chest wall and diaphragm. And then uh, whenever we have the time, we'd like to try to, you know, take a look at the form mechanics of chest radiology lecture. Um, hopefully there's going to be time for you not only to uh, go through um, each of these didactic talks, of which there are 22, um, but also have an opportunity to look at teaching cases that we've collated that actually go with each of these individual presentations so that if you, uh, say, go through the didactic on, um, I don't know, um, consolidation, um, you have some consolidation uh, teaching cases to look at to kind of um, see how you do with real world cases. So that's basically the introduction um, to um, the series of talks. Um, but before um, we wrap this up, um, I would like to spend a little time on this first talk um, just kind of um, giving you a potential model to think about uh, lung opacities for the next uh, few talks um, to follow. Um, I find it useful to have a model of the lung in my mind when I think about stuff that's a little bit easier to think of than the relatively intricate anatomy of the lung. And um, the model I like to use um, is something similar to a blimp that uh, you might recognize from maybe um, you know pictures from long ago, uh, uh, an object called a zeppelin. Um, now, uh, the difference between a zeppelin and a blimp um, has to do a little bit with what's inside. Okay, um, zeppelins are these um, these big or these big airships, you know, 99% gas filled, but with an incredibly intricate internal scaffolding um, inside. And I tend to think about the lung that way too. The lung isn't a just big bag of gas. Um, it's this, you know, mostly gas-filled structure that contains an incredibly fine infrastructure. We don't call this um, scaffolding. We use a term, um, a term interstitium or uh, to refer to that kind of internal framework. And I find that's a pretty helpful way to kind of conceptualize um, from a very basic perspective diseases of the lung. Now, when it comes to um, processes that are going to make the lung abnormally opaque um, on a chest x-ray or a CT or an ultrasound or even an MRI, um, really um, things just boil down to four basic reasons. Uh, there are four basic reasons why lung will look abnormally opaque. One of the reasons is um, whatever space was previously air filled has been replaced by fluid, which is denser than gas. That fluid can be um, blood, it could be water, some sort of pus, um, whatever it is, um, this um, you know, area of lung has been replaced by fluid. So its volume is maintained, but it looks denser now. We call this consolidation. The second reason why um, lung may look abnormally opaque is not because the air spaces have been replaced by fluid, but because the internal scaffolding, the interstitium, has become abnormally thickened. And there are different patterns this thickening can occur in. Some patterns uh, may look like spider webs almost to you. Uh, we call that a reticular interstitial opacity. And sometimes it may even occur kind of nodular, and those are um, nodular interstitial opacities. So that's the second reason why lungs may look abnormally opaque to you. The third re way, reason uh, why lung may look abnormally opaque is um, a situation where gas hasn't been replaced by fluid, the interstitium or scaffolding hasn't become abnormally thickened, but basically um, what kind of structure there is um, has um, been contracted, crushed even, to a smaller volume. Uh, we call this atelectasis or fibrosis. I tend to think of atelectasis as reversible and fibrosis as irreversible. So if we take a look at this um, Zeppelin that actually crashed, um, if you were to take a look at the cross-section of this thing, um, I imagine it'd be pretty dense, much denser than the inflated one we saw a few slides ago. 
it's dense not because the gas inside was replaced by fluid or that the scaffolding got thick and it was just denser because everything's being crushed into a tighter, smaller volume. So third reason for abnormal lung opacity, um, atelectasis fibrosis. And the fourth reason why we may see an abnormal opacity in the lung is because something's growing in it. And uh, we'll refer to that as a nodule or a mass. Uh, nozzles for things that are less than three centimeters and masses that are things that are greater than three centimeters. So whenever I see um, an abnormal opacity of the lung, um, at the end of the day, these are going to be the four main culprits um, that you have to think about. Now, obviously, you can have two or three happening simultaneously, but it comes from basically this list of four. And four things is hopefully relatively easy to remember. Now, um, when we are reporting um, and perhaps interpreting an abnormal lung opacity, um, I think the three most important things to be able to, um, um, I guess, describe or share or what have you are basically, number one, uh, what type of opacity are we looking at? And number two, uh, basically, what's its distribution? And three, where is it? So uh, first, and the, first and foremost, uh, what type of opacity? Well, um, this is basically a kind of a, a chart, if you will, of all the terms I find myself generally using when describing any sort of abnormal opacity in the lung. Okay, um, the way I've kind of uh, arranged these terms on this on table here, um, the, ter table, the terms to the left of the table are the more general um, terms, and as we move to the right of the table, we're talking more specific more specific in terms of morphology or chronicity or distribution, okay? So for example, the most general way I can describe an abnormal lung opacity, I guess, is just the term opacity, um, but maybe I can be a little bit more specific and actually say this thing's a consolidation and not a nodule mass and not an interstitial opacity. Uh, or I can be really, really specific you know, not only is this thing an interstitial opacity, but it's a nodular interstitial opacity, and in fact, it's a century lobular pattern, uh, nodular interstitial opacity. And we'll find that depending on the quality of imaging that we're looking at, um, you know, the more, you know, um, detailed um, imaging we have, like a CT versus a chest x-ray or um, having priors as opposed to no priors, the more likely we're able to use the more specific terms um, towards the right side of this table. And as the imaging gets a little bit poorer, we're kind of obligated to use the more general terms because we just don't have enough imaging information to be specific. Um, so if it's a lousy portable chest x-ray, I doubt I'll be able to tell the difference between centrilobular or tree and bud or even a nodular from a reticular pattern. And so maybe the best I can do is an interstitial opacity. And so, um, you know, when you hear people um, describe and report chest x-rays versus chest CTs, often it feels like you're listening to two different vocabularies, but it's actually just the same vocabulary. You're just hearing people use either more specific or more general terms from this vocabulary. And uh, we'll get uh, into more detail about these terms um, you know, as we kind of go through these future talks. Uh, before I move on to the next slide, um, I just want to point out there's a little um, kind of area here or a little term I've put in here, ground glass opacity, um, which you may have heard of in the past. Ground glass opacities um, really, really shouldn't consider as a fifth um, type of opacity, but rather um, a situation where either consolidation is partial, so you can kind of see through it, or the interstitial opacities are so fine, they're below the spatial resolution of the pixels on an image. And so they look basically um, on a rendered image as kind of see-through. And so ground glass opacities are just, um, I guess you could say, a special situation of consolidation or interstitial opacity. All right, so we describe what kind of opacity or what type we're looking at. We also want to describe what's the distribution. Um, in terms of just like, you know, most general terms, um, is it diffuse? meaning symmetric bilateral, or is it non-diffuse, meaning that there's areas of sparing and you know, areas of involvement kind of scattered around. Um, so that's one way of describing it. We can be a little bit more detailed, perhaps um, focal, multifocal you know, versus diffuse, but um, those are words that will help us describe the distribution, which will um, be informative sometimes in terms of constructing a good differential diagnosis. 
And third and fourth, um, we need to discuss um, sometimes where we see abnormalities. Um, when we're reading a chest CT or an MRI, it's pretty easy to be pretty specific about you know true anatomy, as in segment and lobe of a lung. Um, when you're dealing with a chest X-ray, um, especially if there's no lateral image, um, you know we, we can't always uh, speak in terms of lobes because um, the way the lobes exist, um, there's some overlap. Um, on many parts of the kind of the, the upper, mid, and lower lungs. And so um, I'm accustomed to describing things on a chest x-ray in the lung uh, using this kind of, um, kind of uh, 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 scheme, if you will. Um, I'll divide the lungs into upper, mid, and lower thirds. Um, stuff at the very, very um, kind of upper edge I'll refer to as the apical um, uh, part of the lung and the stuff that's like plastered along the bottom edge I'll refer to as the lung base or basilar and I'll often you know kind of speak in terms of medial or lateral and so if I see a nodule or a scar or consolidation that's relatively focal uh, I can describe it it's in the medial upper lung or the um, lateral lower um, lung um, one quick thing about CT scans um, it's, um, you know, obviously we can always localize things in terms of segment and lobe, but sometimes um, describing its relationship relative to the, um, the lung's general anatomy is useful. And so three um, kind of terms I find useful are central versus peripheral, and then the term peribronchovascular, um, if I'm seeing a phenomenon that seems to be hugging the bronchovascular bundles.